Join me for a hymn sing at the 2024 Issues Etc. Making the Case Conference, Friday, July 12th, and Saturday, July 13th at Concordia University, Chicago. This year's theme, Hymns for the Battle. Learn more and register at issuesetc.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. To Paul, this characterizes the way that the Gentiles had ended up living their lives. They saw nothing wrong with any sexual appetite and believed it was healthy to indulge yourself limitlessly by gratifying them all. This is largely where the so-called sexual revolution of the last century has left people today. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Galatians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. In our last study, Paul pointed out that if he were still preaching circumcision as necessary for justification and salvation, then he wouldn't be suffering persecution. He would thus have removed the offense of the cross. That is, the fact that on his cross, Christ accomplished the salvation of all mankind by bearing our sins in his own body, and that there's nothing we can do to add to that salvation. Then he wished that his opponents, who insist on circumcision, would emasculate themselves. That is, that they would stop being able to propagate and gain followers for their new false gospel. Then Paul returned to the theme of Christian freedom. It is a freedom from sin and a freedom for sonship. It sets you free to serve the neighbor in love. Paul then reminded his readers that the whole law is fulfilled in the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. But he warned that if instead they're biting and devouring one another, they better watch out, lest they be consumed by one another. The alternative to biting and devouring is to walk in the spirit, and then you will not be gratifying the desires of the flesh. St. Paul pointed out how conflicted Christians always are, with the flesh tugging us one way, the Holy Spirit tugging us the opposite way, and how very frustrating this is for both the old self and the new self. More on that battle in what follows here. A reading from Galatians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 18th verse. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Galatians 5, verses 18 through 26. Let us pray. Grant, we beg you, Almighty God, to us and to your whole church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound but a free course, and be preached and taught to the joy and the edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide to our end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to ponder today's passage? Let's dig into it. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So notice the but. 
that connects these words directly to the opposition that Paul had just been describing between the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit and how their constant opposition to each other keep you from doing what you want to do. That is, the spirit seeking always to keep you from doing what the flesh wants and the flesh seeking always to keep you from doing what the spirit wants. So given this implacable opposition between the two, Paul says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. 16th century reformer Martin Luther expresses Paul's thought here like this. Only concentrate on this, that you be led by the Spirit, that is, that you obey the will which is opposed to the flesh, and that you refuse to gratify the desires of the flesh. For this is what it means to be led and drawn by the Spirit, and then you will not be under the law. The flesh, you see, in its disdain for the law and in the gratification of its desires, lands you right back under the law's condemnation. The Spirit, however, leads to the freedom that is from condemnation. But now Paul gives a very stark description of these differences between the two impulses, that of the flesh and that of the spirit. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. They are evident, Paul says, because if you look around you in the world, this is what you see. And what's even worse if you look within you at your old Adam's own desires, this is also what you see. These are the works of the flesh, the actions toward which your sinful nature in its rebellion against God, it's constantly pushing you. It's not an accident that Paul starts off with these three, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Sexual immorality refers to the gratifying of your sexual appetites, whichever way they are inclined, and without any restriction. To Paul, this characterizes the way that the Gentiles had ended up living their lives. They saw nothing wrong with any sexual appetite and believed it was healthy to indulge yourself limitlessly by gratifying them all. This is largely where the so-called sexual revolution of the last century has left people today. By impurity, Paul is referring to moral uncleanness, the attraction to what defiles. By sensuality, he means a life of chasing after pleasure. If it feels good, well, then do it. And if you're chasing the high, you always have to indulge yourself in it more and more because of the law of diminishing returns. Paul moves next to these items, verse 20. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Idolatry, of course, is the worship of the creature instead of the creator, looking to some created being or thing for what ought only be sought from the living God. Sorcery often runs hand in glove with idolatry as an attempt to manipulate the false gods of this age. But then Paul moves back from violations of the first table of the law to violations of the second table. What enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions all have in common is the way they tear at the fabric of family and society, and that they all result from the flesh's enthronement of itself and its desires on the seat of the human life, demanding of others that they submit themselves to that petty tyrant within. Yes, these are indeed the opposite of loving the neighbor as oneself. Verse 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Envy and drunkenness are straightforward. Orgies refers to the drinking parties that were common in the Greek culture and associated with the cult of Bacchus. They were frequently occasions for all kinds of sexual immorality, no doubt through the lowered inhibitions that follow from overconsumption of alcohol or other mind-altering substances, Paul has no question that the flesh, also the flesh inside of every Christian, tugs toward such behaviors. But he issues a stern warning, verse 21 continued, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who do such things 
or better, as the ESV footnote has it, those who make a practice of doing such things. In other words, those who habitually indulge the flesh and its desires. Paul says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. As 15th century Greek theologian St. Nicholas Gavisilis wrote in his marvelous little book, The Life in Christ, But if the life to come were to admit those who lack the faculties and senses necessary for it, it would avail nothing for their happiness. But they would be dead and miserable, living in that blessed and immortal world. The reason is that the light would appear and the sun shine with its pure rays with no eye, having been formed to see it. The Spirit's fragrance would be abundantly diffused and pervading all, but one would not know it without already having a sense of smell. You get what he means there? The one who has trained him or herself in the indulgence of the flesh has forfeited the formation of the senses necessary for enjoying the kingdom. I think that's profound. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. So, in contrast to the way that the flesh tugs, the Spirit produces within us his fruit. Now note, fruit there is singular, so not fruits. I think we do well to hear it as love, but then as the various dimensions of love in our life, such as joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Note how these as fruit of the Spirit's life within us are not restless and troubled like the works of the flesh. Rather, there's a serenity that pervades them all. And these are not virtues that men attain. They're rather gifts which the Spirit gives, the fruit of his holy presence in our lives. They describe the very essence of the blessed Trinity. And so these come into our lives as a result of our communion with him. To share these with us, he has created us and then redeemed us when we had fallen. Two more to add to the above, verse 23. Gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Gentleness is again a mark of God himself. Did not Jesus say in Matthew 11, verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Self-control is probably best heard as chastity. Run through the fruit of the Spirit and you see that, indeed, it is all fruit of love and all byproduct of God's loving presence. The law is not opposed to any of these things at all. It's rather what the law as the expression of God's will for human beings has always been pointing to, but which it never could attain by itself. Verse 24, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, with its passions and desires. To belong to Jesus is to have crucified the flesh with all its perverted passions and desires. That happened to us in baptism. As St. Basil so beautifully confessed in the 4th century, we crucify the flesh, of course, by being baptized in the water of baptism, which is a likeness of the cross and his death, his entombment, and his resurrection, as it is written. And baptism means an ongoing crucifixion of our flesh's sinful desires. As the Lutheran large catechism states so clearly, now when we enter Christ's kingdom, this corruption must daily decrease so that the longer we live, the more gentle, patient, and meek we become, and the more free from greed, hatred, envy, and pride. Verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Our new life came to us by the Holy Spirit's imparting the gift of faith, so Paul urges us to march to the Spirit's beat or to dance to his rhythm, to follow his course. The Spirit thus teaches us to forsake the fleshly ways of conceit, provocation, and envy. He marches or dances us right away from them. And that's where we're going to call our hiatus for today. Next up, Paul will unpack what all this means for correcting those who have erred, who are caught in a transgression. 
He calls for humility and gentleness as we work to restore our brother, forsaking all pride. He reminds us to test our own work and not to be boasting about ourselves in comparison to our neighbor. That sideways glance is always deadly. Till next time then, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.